So in section 4.5, we're going to continue to work with the complementation rule and the addition rule and the multiplication rule, mostly the multiplication rule and the complementation rule. Let's go back and kind of review our understanding of the complementation rule. Complementation rule replies to complementary events, that is A and the complement of A, or sometimes I call it not A, whereas you have heads and a tails, or a boy and a girl, or you roll a six, or you don't roll a six. Basically, it's the opposite of the event. Now, those two events, A and the complement of A, which would be everything here in blue, A bar, are going to comprise everything in your sample space. So that when you add the probability of getting a heads plus the probability of getting a tails, you're going to get one. Probability of getting a boy plus the probability of getting a girl is one. Or probability of rolling a six and probability of rolling something other than a six, again, it's one. Now the purpose of this is that sometimes it's easier to calculate the probability of an event by doing one minus the probability of its complement. And that's what we're going to practice first is understanding what the complement is and then we'll work on using that to find other probabilities. But right now let's concentrate on describing the complement. So when a couple has five children, none of the five is a girl. Assume that boys and girls are equally likely. All right, so we want to describe the complement of an event. Let's first describe all the possible things that can happen with an event. So we've got a couple that are having uh, five kids. So, so number of girls. What are the possible outcomes of having five kids? How many girls can you have? What's possible? Um, I heard a lot of numbers, one, two, three, four, five. There's one more, zero. So that is a possibility. <clears throat> so it says, when a couple has five children, none of them is a girl. So none of them is a girl would refer to just this one. None of them is a girl. Well, how would you describe the rest of it? So if this is our event A, then this is A bar here. It's the complement. It's like everything else. What description would you give to the complement here? How could you describe that to somebody? At least one of them is a girl. Exactly what I would have chosen. Thanks, Dan. So at least one of them is a girl. Okay, so that's your compliment. And a lot of times your clue in these types of problems to use the complement is if you're seeing at least or at most. If you see those words as part of the problem, then that's telling you that you should probably be using the complementation rule as part of your calculation. Let's take a look at problem number eight. It's a nice example of that. Mm, I think this is it's another description. It says, uh, you know what? Else? No. All right. Well, let's, let's do number eight anyways. When four digits between 0 and 9 inclusive are randomly selected with replacement for a lottery ticket, none of them, none of the digits is a 7. So, again, you want to look at the different things that can happen. So the number of sevens in a four-digit number. So 
number of sevens in a four digit number. So again, what are the possibilities here? If you're drawing out a four digit number, how many sevens could you end up with? Zero, one, two, three, and four. So you've got event A that none of them is a seven. None of them is a seven. And give yourself a moment to try and figure out what a complement is. What would a complement be? Yeah at, least yeah, at least one of them is a seven. At least one of them is a seven. Cool. So again, when you see the words at least and at most, start thinking the complementation rule. I was actually thinking of problem number 10 when I was uh, talking just a minute ago of, of applying this stuff. A statistics student plans to use the TI-84 plus calculator on her exam. From past experience, she estimates there's a 92% probability that the calculator will work on any given day. Because the final exam is so important, she plans to use redundancy by bringing two uh, TI-84 plus calculators. What is the probability she will be able to complete her exam with a working calculator. Does she really gain much by bringing a backup calculator? Explain. Okay. So let's try and understand uh, this probability that they're asking you to calculate. Probability that uh, the calculator will work. Let's see where, uh, what is the probability that she'll be able to complete her exam? What has to be true in order to complete her exam about the calculating calculators? She has to have at least one that works, right? Could be one, the other, or both. Doesn't matter, but at least one has to work in order for her to be able to complete her exam. So, let me go to um, probability of at least one. working calculator. So like I said, there's a, there's a lot of different ways that this could happen. Um, but the, the easiest way to calculate this is through the complement. Because you could have one calculator work, the other calculator work, etc. It'd be, what's the complement of this event? Probably that at least one calculator works. What would be the opposite of that? None work. None work. Yeah, none work. So what's the probability? So one minus the probability that um, neither calculator works. And that's something we can calculate pretty easily. Probability that neither calculator works. So what kind of notation should we give ourselves here for the, for the event that one of the calculators doesn't work? Oh, sure. Yes, we're going to assume that, yes. So we're going to assume that probability that a calculator works is 92%. Or let's call the probability of W equals 0.92. What do I mean by this? 
probability of W bar? Probability that it doesn't work. Stacy, what's the probability that it doesn't work? 8%. Remember, it's going to be 1 minus the probability that it does work, which is 1 minus 0 0.92, 0 0.08. That's the probability that it doesn't work. So a way to describe this, then, is the probability that neither works would be W1 bar. And what else? W2 bar. That the first one doesn't work, nor does the second one. Neither of them work. Now here's the big thing from the last section. In the last section, we learned about what kind of events. What was the last section all about? Independent events. Do you think the, the probability that this calculator works is going to be somehow related to the probability that this calculator works? No, no they're, they're different calculators. You know? So we're going to assume that these probabilities, and it's a reasonable assumption, are independent. So that makes this calculation a little bit easier. That's 1 minus probability of W1 bar times probability of W2 bar. Well, we've got these probabilities, right? It's 1 minus 0 0.08 times 0 0.08. 0 0.0064 should be. So 1 minus 0 0.08 times 0 0.08 is 0 0.9936. So with two calculators, is there a good chance that she can complete the exam? Yeah, absolutely. It's a real good chance. Did she gain a lot by using that redundancy strategy? Mm, yeah, I'd say pretty good. Yeah, 7%. I mean, here, suppose you, suppose you just had one calculator, if this was true. Would it be really, really unusual for a calculator not to work and for you not to be able to complete the exam? Would it be really unusual? Not really. 8% chance, that's it's not exactly rare. I mean, it'd be unlikely, but it's not exactly rare. But here, there's a really good chance you're going to complete the exam. So you got a 99.36% chance. That's a really good chance. So definitely using the redundancy here helps out a lot. Is there any follow-up here on problem number 10? Are we okay with that one? We definitely going to want to take our time through some of this stuff, but if there's some questions, please let me know. Let's try problem number 18. Based on a poll conducted through email by USA Today, 41% of the survey respondents most like to get compliments at work from their coworkers. Among 12 randomly selected workers, what is the probability of getting at least one who most likes getting compliments from coworkers? How is the result affected by the additional information that the survey subjects volunteered to respond? So let's take one at a time and try and understand this first probability. We're selecting 12 people at random and trying to find the probability of getting at least one who most likes to get compliments from their co-workers. So let's list all the different things that can happen. So you're selecting 
n equals 12 people. You want to know the number of people who like getting compliments from their coworkers. Number who like compliments. from co-workers. So what are the possibilities here? How many could like it and how many might not like it, etc.? How many how many could you find? Well, 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9, 10, 11, 12. What I want you to do is figure out what here I should circle when I describe the event at least one. So at least one likes to get compliments from coworkers. What's that? What's that event? Circle that in the sample space here. What should I circle? What number should I circle? 1 through 12. So if I want to calculate the probability of at least 1, so I'll call this event A, at least 1, probability of A, boy, that's a lot. You'd have to probably find the probability that one person likes it, plus the probability that two people like it, plus 3, plus 4, plus 5, all the way up to 12. That'd be a real drag. It'd put a damper on your afternoon to have to do it by brute force. So is there a better way we can approach finding this probability? Mm, don't have to worry about the 5% rule here. It's a good thought. What's that? Um, no, it's nothing with the multiplication rule. So we could calculate all these probabilities. Subtract from what? What's this event? If this is event A, what could I describe this event as? Yeah. The complement of A or A naught? A bar. Lots of different ways we can describe that. But the probability of event A is 1 minus the probability of its complement. And that's the important thing to use here. When you see this, when you see in the problem phrases like at least or at most, that's it's begging you to use the complementation rule. Because this really works out to the probability of um not finding anybody who likes getting compliments uh, from their coworkers. All right, so one minus probability of I don't know. Let's call it uh, zero. Getting some, getting nobody who likes getting compliments at work. So. Let's work on calculating this probability. Uh, what has to happen for the probability or for this event to occur? That means the first person doesn't like getting compliments, second person, third person, fourth, all the way up to the twelfth. All twelve of them have to say, you know what? I really don't like getting compliments from my coworkers. So that'd be kind of strange, but I guess it could happen. Uh, so let's see, be the Event 
a person likes compliments. Uh, what's the probability of C according to to this uh, problem? 41%. So 0.41 or 41%. All right. Thanks, Dan. How about C bar? Albana? Oh, it's... Yeah, 1 minus 0. 0.41. So what's C bar saying? Yeah, there's a lot of people who don't like compliments. So 1 minus 0. 0.59. Or 1 minus 0. 0.41 equals 0. 0.59. Sorry. Um, yeah. Where's... Scratch 0.41 equals 0.59. All right, so 59% of people don't like getting compliments. Now, really, this event, what's happening in that event? Nobody out of the 12 people you got likes getting compliments. So that's going to be probability of 0 means that the first person doesn't like a compliment, second person doesn't like a compliment, etc. Um, so, let's see. C1 bar and C2 bar all the way down to the 12th one. None of them like compliments. There's one crucial step here, and that is, how do I calculate this? Well, there's an assumption that I can make. Do you think somebody's preference in this regard to liking compliments is going to influence somebody else's opinion? No. So if that's true, then what's, uh, what's true about these things? A couple of people have said it. These are independent events. So we can calculate this as a probability of C1 times the probability of C2, etc. times the probability of C12. So why don't you work on calculating that probability? Finish up this entire calculation. This is one probability. Remember, we always want to put that in and find the overall <laughs> probability.
two. It should be, it should be pretty close to one. Yeah, these should all be C bar. Probability that you find somebody that doesn't like a complement. Now we know one of these probabilities, each one of them is 0.59. So 0.59 times 0.59 12 times is 0.59 to the 12th power. So that's the probability of getting nobody who likes compliments from their workers. So it's going to be a pretty small number. Our overall goal was to find the probability that at least one person out of the 12 likes getting compliments from workers. So that probability of at least one was one minus the probability of zero. So one minus... Uh, probability of 0 is going to be 1 minus 0.59 to the 12th. And like I said, this should be, this is going to be a really small probability, so this should be close to 1. 1 minus 0.59 raised, oops, so 1 minus 0.59 raised to the 12th. About a 99.8% chance. So yeah, it's, it's very likely that there's going to be at least somebody who likes getting compliments at work. All right, that one's a challenging problem, so if there's something you'd like me to go back at and uh, discuss a little bit further, I'd be more than happy to. Is there some aspect here where you're like, all right, you lost me from here to here. Well, let me just recap this then. We wanted the probability that at least one would receive a, would like to receive compliments from coworkers. So that's all this. Rather than calculate all 12 of these probabilities, we can work with the complement. And when you see stuff like at least or at most, please start thinking of the complement. And that's what we did. So, if C is an event that a person likes a compliment, that probability is 41%. The probability that they don't like a compliment is 59%. To get nobody in our survey who, who likes a compliment, that means all 12 of them have to not like compliments. There's a 59% chance that somebody doesn't like a compliment at work. That's fine. To get all 12 of them like that, since these are going to be independent events, we'll calculate the probability as the product of these 12 events, product of those 12 people not liking compliments at work. is 0.59 multiplied by itself 12 times. Plugging that in our calculation originally, 1 minus that probability, probability of 0, is about 99.8%. So a good chance that you get at least one person that likes compliments at work. Let's try problem number 16. According to the FBI, 12.4% of burglaries are cleared with arrest. A new detective is assigned to five different burglaries. What is the probability that at least one of them is cleared with the arrest? What is the probability that a detective clears five burglaries with arrest? What should we conclude if the detective clears all five burglary, burglaries with arrest? So. 
We'll start out with the 12.4%. Burglaries are cleared with a rest. So let's let C be the event. A burglary. Burglary is cleared with an arrest. Probability of C is 0.124, according to the problem. What is the probability that at least one of them is cleared with an arrest? So if we have five burglaries, um, then we can look at the number cleared with an arrest. Now, in order to start learning this stuff, you need to start being a little bit active here. So, uh, I want some help on this one, and from you know somebody other than just the usual suspects, please. What are the possibilities here? How many of these could be cleared with an arrest? What's my sample space, in other words? Good. Zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Good. Zero through five. So, you can strike out all together. Or you could run the tables and get all five of them cleared with the rest. But zero through five are the number of possibilities. The first problem asks, what is the probability that at least one is cleared with an arrest? So circle, circle the events that could satisfy that, at least one. So at least one, you should be circling this event. A is the event that at least one is cleared. To calculate the probability of A directly, you'd have to calculate the probability of one, or two, or three, or four, or five. And that'd be a lot of work to go at it directly. So what else could we do? What other ideas? Yeah, you can use the complement. The probability of A is one minus the probability of not A, or A complement. So let's understand the probability of A complement. Um, let's see. Keeping with my notation, we know the probability of, of one getting cleared is 0.124. What's the probability that something doesn't get cleared? Good. It's just 1 minus 0 0.124, 0 0.876. Thank you. Describe what has to happen if if none of them get cleared. What's happening if none of them get cleared in terms of C or C bar? What's what's going on? Perfect. So the probability that none of these get cleared, or the event that none of them get cleared, means probability that the first one doesn't get cleared, and the second one doesn't get cleared and the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one. Now the purpose of this exercise is to, uh, to use the complementation rule and to use the independence here. I think you could probably argue that 
you know, the probability of cleaning of clearing these cases might actually be dependent, right? I mean, depends how good the detective is, right? If you get a good detective, well, maybe that changes the probabilities. But we're going to assume that these are independent cases and that uh, the probability of clearing them up from one to the next is going to be an independent event. So what does that, what's that do for our calculation of this probability? What can I now do on this one? Yeah, this becomes the product of the probabilities. It's a probability of C1 bar, probability of C2 bar. And you don't have to show me all this fancy notation on an exam. I'm just doing it so that if you go back and look at the notes, that you have something to look at and you can try and follow along. But it's going to be 0.876 times itself five times. And 0.876 to the fifth power would be the probability of A bar. That's a probability of none of them are cleared. In fact, let's write that down here. Um, a bar is that none are cleared. So overall, the probability that at least one have cleared, probability of A, equals 1 minus the probability of A bar, so it's 1 minus uh, 0.876 to the fifth power. Let's find the probability that at least one is cleared. So there's a 48% chance that at least one is cleared. Doesn't sound, does that sound encouraging? It doesn't sound very encouraging. One, I mean, you're kind of setting the bar low at one and one of them getting, uh, at least one getting solved and you got less than a 50% chance. Not encouraging. So about 48.4%. Let's look at the probability that all five of them are cleared with a rest. So why don't you see if you can't find kind of the other extreme. Find the probability that all five are cleared with an arrest.
timing. Okay, so again, the thing to, to use here is the independence of these events and basically calculate this as the product of probabilities. Now we know the probability of a cleared investigation is 0.124. So what you're going to get is 0.124 raised to the fifth power. Oops, 4, 1, 2, 4 raised to the fifth power. Now that's going to be a pretty small number, I'm thinking. So 0.124 raised to the fifth power. Wow. What is this what is this all about? This 2.931, etc. E negative 5. Yeah, that's a number in scientific notation. So what this really stands for is 2.9316, etc. times 10 to the negative fifth power. If you want to write that in decimal notation to better understand it. Uh, the negative 5 power means you're going to move the decimal 5 places to the left. Now, once you move it past the 2, the rest of them are going to be zeros. So you'll have one less zero than there are there are numbers in this exponent. So four zeros, zero, 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 two, nine, three, one, six, etc. So what's your conclusion about some detective who clears up all five cases uh, of the burglars. Yeah. He's, yeah. Give that guy a promotion. Have him investigate the Russian elections or something like that. You know? But definitely uh, that or he got some really easy cases. I'm not sure. But, yeah, this, this is an unusual result. All right? You don't expect that kind of result. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, something that makes sense out of such a small result. I think the author put in two um, two different comments uh, one that yeah that's an unusual result it's really good or that you got some really easy cases one of the two he doesn't always throw in too much humor okay so the, the last two problems are essentially kind of getting at the same thing uh, we're using the complementation rule and we're using independence amongst these things certainly there will be some of the more challenging problems that you would face on an exam so if there's something about this, you're like, yeah, I'm just not so sure, fire away. All right. Let the record show that there's no questions, Your Honor. Uh, let's do a couple more. Going back to our notation that the, uh, well, let's see. I don't know if I've introduced this notation yet in this section or not. I think I did. Yes, sir, Chuck? Please. Uh, could you go over again how we determine to use the complementary rule? Okay, good. Um, your clue in using the complementation rule is when you see things like at least one or at most, etc. So in looking at all the different things that can happen, you could calculate uh, this event of at least one is cleared. You could calculate it directly. That'd be a lot of work, Chuck. Let's take a look here what that would involve. Um, to get probability of A, A is what's called a compound event. It's made up of a bunch of different events. So the probability of A really means the probability that you have, uh, we'll call it one cleared, or two cleared, or three cleared, or four cleared, or five cleared. So it's a lot of stuff. And within this, oh man, I mean there's, there's five different ways that you could have just one case cleared. You could have the first one cleared, the second one cleared, the third one, etc. So you'd have five different calculations there, and then... Um, six, I think there's six ways here, etc. Six here, five, and then one. So it'd just be an enormous amount of calculation. But if you look at your sample space and say, well, gee, the opposite of at least one 
is exactly zero, boy, I'd rather calculate one probability than all of these. And so your big hint is that you're using these these descriptors of at least most, at least or at most, so that you can start using the complement. Rather than doing all this, I'll just do that one. So that's the big clue in these types of problems. Thanks for the question. Okay, let's go back to the book for some more problems then. Number 22. Problem number 22 is going to take us to a familiar table, um, one that we've looked at before. It's the table at the start of, uh, I think it's, I don't know, let's see, uh, which table is it? Yeah, table 4.1. Uh, trying to like, do we use that table at some point? Yeah, I'll just copy it down again. All right, so we're going to go back to the table at the beginning of 4.1. So we've got positive results and negative results. And let me just copy that down for us here. And I'm going to kind of be a little bit more short with my descriptions. Uh, let's do uses, doesn't use, and then positive test. Negative test. So there was 44 who had a positive test result who used drugs. There was 6 who had a false negative. There was 90 with a false positive. And there was 860 with a true negative. So they gave me 50 here, 950 here, and an even 1,000, 866, and then 134. So that's our sample space. These are all the different things that are happening in this. And we're going to calculate a few conditional probabilities. Now, conditional probabilities means they're going to tell you a little bit of something about your experiment, and that's going to affect the outcome, or it could affect the outcome of your experiment, how likely you think things are. And problem number 22 actually goes over something called the inverse probabilities, and it's just meant to show you that these two things are different. So the probability of a negative test result given that the subject does not use drugs. So negative result given that the subject does not use drugs. Subject does not use drugs. So let's understand that, that second part a little bit better. They're telling us that the subject does not use drugs. So instead of having, this should be 1,000 here, um, instead of having 1,000 people here, then how many people do we have realistically to consider in our sample space? 950. 
because we're eliminating all those people. Eliminating the 50 that use drugs. So, given that you have somebody that doesn't use drugs, what's the probability of a negative result? Well, our denominator now is no longer the 1,000. It's the 950 who don't use drugs. So our denominator now is 950. Because they're telling us we're just looking at the people who don't use drugs. What's the probability of a negative result? 860 of those thousand or of those 950 have a negative result. So in lowest terms, 86 out of 95. But I don't care about lowest terms. I'm happy for you to give it to me like this. So you're basically, by telling you that, okay, we're limiting things, then, then you've changed your sample space. It's no longer the 1,000. Let's flip that around. Probability that the subject doesn't use drugs given a negative result. So think about this one for a second. Think about what this would mean. The, the problem is telling you you've got a negative result. What's the probability that they actually didn't use drugs? And if you get that, try and think which one of these would an employer be able to actually know? Okay, so the problem is telling you you've got a negative result. So that means I can kind of limit things a little bit. If I've got a negative result, basically it's telling me I'm right here on my table. So what's the probability that subject doesn't use drugs given that they have a negative result. Thank you. So you got 860 who don't use it out of the 866 that had a negative result. So 860 divided by 866. Now of these two, this one would be the one that an employer would be, I think, interested in because uh, the only thing the employer knows is the result of the test. They're not going to know this right now. They're hoping that this percentage is high. If that percentage is high, then a negative result means, okay, you know, probably doesn't use drugs. Uh, in this case, that's got to be close to 99%, I'm thinking. Uh, 860 divided by 866, yeah, 99.3%. So pretty good. If you got a negative test result back from this test, then that's there's a pretty good chance you got a, a clean bill of health. Let's try one last one from the section. It's problem number 28. And we got a little bit of counting procedures to do in section 4.6, and then we'll be done with the things for the lesson part of today. We will have a review part. So after having a sonogram, a pregnant woman learns that she will have twins. What is the probability that she will have 
fraternal twins. So let's just do a little bit of uh, work here right in the book. There's, uh, from this data, there's 10 sets of identical twins and 20 set of fraternal twins for a total of 30. And then the other marginal totals would be 10, 5, 5, and 10, which again adds up to 30, so that's reassuring. So back to the question. After having a sonogram, a pregnant woman learns that she will have twins. What is the probability that she will have fraternal twins? So probability of fraternal twins. Well, you can look at the marginal totals here. How many... Uh, how many pieces of data are there in this table? 30. How many of them represent fraternal twins? So 20 divided by 30 is 2 thirds. So probability of F is 2 thirds. Now, you're going to have to think a little bit on this one. After studying the sonogram more closely, the physician tells the pregnant woman that she will be giving birth to twins consisting of one boy and one girl. What is the probability that she will have fraternal twins? Or, is it fraternal? Sorry. Uh, what, is, what is the probability that she will have fraternal twins? Yeah. Yeah, if you've got if you've got one boy and one girl, then you're here on your data set. You have one boy and one girl. How many identical twins are in this data? None. How many fraternal twins? Well, all of them. So the chance of a fraternal twin at that point, if you have a boy and a girl, is one, which makes sense. I mean, identical twins wouldn't be one boy and one girl. That's not very identical there at that point, I don't think. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, so probability of fraternal given that there's one boy and one girl. So that would be 100%. 100% chance you're going to have uh, fraternal twins. Okay, that's good for this section. Let me give you out some homework. Um, and I'll give that out to you when you get back. I want to take a quick look at it. So let's take a break. We'll come back. We'll cover section 4.6, and then we'll do uh, a review.